Let's turn together again in God's Word to Exodus 20. And we continue our study of the Ten Commandments, uh, taking a second time to work our way through the Second Commandment. So the sermon tonight will be focused on verse, through verses 4 through 6, specifically really 5 and 6, as we deal with the reasons that God gives us for our obedience to His Second Commandment. But in order to familiarize, to reacquaint ourselves with the moral law of God, we want to read uh, the entirety of the Ten Commandments. So I'll be reading from verses 1 through 17. Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17, where God's word reads as follows. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me, and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. So far the reading from God's word this evening. May he add his blessing to our hearts. Well, last Lord's Day, as we began to work our way through the second commandment, we began by looking at this commandment as an explanation of how the saints are to worship uh, the Lord. Uh, God is not satisfied for His people simply to worship Him in whatever way seems fit to them, but God demands that He be worshipped according to His own commandments. We must worship God, we saw last Lord's Day, according to His law. And that really uh, stems from the summary of the first table of the law. So the first table, the first four commandments of the, of the moral law, they're all directed, they're all directing us in how we are to wor- worship and love God. Our relationship with God is in view. And whenever the first table of the law is summarized in the Gospels, whether it be in Matthew 22 or, or Mark 12 or Luke 10, in all of those places, uh, the person summarizing the law rightly summarizes the first table as being commandments that govern how we love God and that we are to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, when it calls us to love God, we know from other places of Scripture that love for God has boundaries. Love for God is not some undefined emission of emotion. It's not some some emotive element of the Christian experience. No, it is love for God, affection for God, expressed within boundaries that God has set for us in His Word. And so, John 14, 15 should be a verse that as Christians we are familiar with, that that we refer to. It's that verse that says that if we love God, we will keep His commandments. If we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and if we are called to worship God according to the first four commandments of the moral law, which all of those things are true, then we must do so according to God's word. So, so the commandments, second commandment included, 
uh, does not say uh, that we as God's people can democratically decide issue X, Y, and Z. And the same thing is true for the worship of the Lord. We are not able, we are not permitted as God's people to democratically determine how God is to be worshipped. If we get enough people interested, 50% plus one, then we somehow can worship God in, in this way or that way. No, to love God in worship is to know His direction, to acknowledge His direction, and then to follow His direction in worship by doing the things that He commands. And so we saw all of that sitting underneath the second commandment last week, and then beyond that, we saw the consequences of, of ignoring that commandment. We looked at Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus 10, the sons of Aaron, who offer false fire before the Lord. So they were seeking, at least ostensibly, to worship God, doing it in their own way, and, and God struck them down with fire. Or, or Uzzah, 2 Samuel 6, when the ark is being transferred to Jerusalem, instead of following God's commandments by carrying the ark on poles and not touching the sacred things that God had set apart, instead, they put the ark on an ox. Uzzah reaches back to try to stabilize the ark to keep it from falling. Right? Fairly good intentions, you would say, even. And God strikes him down for not worshiping him, for not loving him, according to his own commandments. Now, uh, just the last point of review is that the shape of that worship was acknowledged to have changed. And, and our, our studies in Hebrews have helped us with that, help us to see very clearly that first covenant, second covenant worship are not the same. Uh, the sacrifice is completed in Christ, and Christ has done away with first covenant ceremonial worship, and, and it has been replaced with a new, better covenant expression, covenant worship expression. And so we did see, notice that the, that the form of, of worship was changed from Old Testament to New Testament, but that the principle that is contained in the second commandment remains the same. Still, we are called to worship God according to His commandments. We're, we're not called to worship God according to our own desires. And so last week we looked at the nuts and bolts of, of how that worked and, and some of the ways that that would be expressed. This week, what we want to look at the second part of the commandment that we didn't get to at all last Lord's Day, which is the motivation or the reasons that God gives us contained in this commandment as to why we should follow this second commandment. And in order to give us reasons for following this second commandment, God, in fact, lays before us three reasons uh, in this commandment. And these three reasons would help us to see that the way God is worshipped actually shapes all of man's interaction with God, whether it be for good or ill. So a disregard for this commandment will negatively shape your relationship with God a following of this commandment will positively uh, shape your life in your relationship with God. So the way God is worshipped shapes our relationship with Him, both for good and for ill. And to learn that lesson tonight, we want to look at the three reasons. That's, that's all we're going to do is we're going to look at the three reasons that are contained in this commandment so that we would learn the significance of worshipping God according to His own description. And so we're going to see the zeal of God, which is the first reason given. We're going to see the wrath of God, which is the second reason given. And we're going to see the love of God as the third reason given. So let's begin by looking at the zeal of God to help us understand why the form of worship, the way we worship God is of such great significance. So the first reason that we see in verse 5 is that... We are to worship God according to His ways because of who He is. Worship for the Lord, worship given to Him, is not a neutral enterprise for Him. Uh, God does not feel, in a, He doesn't feel neutrally about the way we come to Him. God is concerned for His worship. And, and that then puts within a, a box an understanding of the way that we are to love God and express that love uh, in worship. And certainly we understand that within our, our personal relationships. We, we, when we express love for other people, we are uh, hopelessly inept if we seek to express love for another person according to our own preferences. 
right? So if I, in, in my house, try to love Lisa by doing things for her that I would like, that might be very nice for me, but it most likely will be missed by Lisa. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, Lisa loves to sew, and she has spent research uh, sewing, and I just know lingo. I don't really know what these things mean, but if I were to go online and buy a foot for Lisa's sewing machine, most likely there would be more tears than rejoicing in our home because I would buy the wrong brand, I would buy it with the wrong function, I wouldn't understand what I was doing, I would be purchasing something for her according to my desires. And, and so there are some times, some instances, where the expression of gifts or the purchasing of gifts is better left to the person who desires the gift. You know, you understand what I mean? That, that is better, you're better off sometimes just to let the person purchase the gift for themselves. And the same thing is true with the zeal of God for his worship. The zeal of God means that God is particular about how he is to be approached and how he is to be loved. We cannot love God according to our own desires. Oftentimes it's counterproductive to love God according to our own desires. So God, he has zeal for his worship, and that zeal for his worship is established in two subways, subsets, uh, in our text. The first one, it says uh, in verse 5, that the Lord is a jealous God. God is jealous for his worship. Now, jealousy is a word that in our time is associated with insecurity, abusiveness, other negative sentimentalities like that. Jealousy is not a positive word in our time. But we know that God is not insecure, and we know that God is not abusive. So how do we understand this word jealousy as it relates to God? Well, there is another way of understanding the word jealousy, or To be jealous. To be jealous doesn't need to be grounded in insecurity, but you can also be jealous in the sense that you desire to defend the honor of something. You could be jealous in the sense that you are concerned for the character of something. And that's God's jealousy. That's the way in which God is jealous. God is jealous. He is concerned about the character of the purity of his worship. And so he protects that character for his people in the structure of the second commandment. He defends the worship he deserves, and he doesn't tolerate any rivals when it comes to false worship. And when that is the cause, and when the motivation for jealousy is right, then actually jealousy is a good thing. Jealousy isn't always a bad thing, and we see that in our day-to-day living as well. Most often when we think of jealousy, we, we, we found it in a kind of a sinful form of jealousy, which is pervaded with a paranoia, a gross insecurity within a relationship, oftentimes the case. But I think we would agree that within the marriage relationship, there is a healthy jealousy. If a husband or a wife senses that there is an encroachment, an attack on the health of the relationship of the husband and wife by an outside interloper, it would be right for that wife, for that husband, to jealously protect that marriage relationship. It's not, a, it's not a wrong thing. It's not a paranoid thing. It is a healthy thing to protect the character, to be concerned about the honor of the marriage relationship. So you can be jealous in a right way. The sinful form of jealousy is grounded in insecurity, grounded in paranoia. But the righteous expression of jealousy is is expressed through a sense of protection, a sense of healthy responsibility over uh, some aspect of a relationship. And, And so when we think of God being jealous for his worship, that's how we're thinking about it. We're we're thinking about it in terms of a healthy concern for the character of the worship of his people, a desire to defend the honor of his own worship, the only worship that is worth anything. And so, in the first place, point 1A, when we're thinking about uh, the reason given to us for uh, worshiping God according to his own desires, 
is the fact that God is a jealous God, that God seeks to preserve and protect and defend the honor of the worship that belongs to Him. But there's a second part, the second part where we see uh, God protecting worship be- simply because of who He is, and that's in seeing that God is sovereign. So God is not only jealous, it says in our commandment, but it's also He is also a sovereign. And we see that in verse 5 when it says that He visits the iniquity of the fathers on the children. When the worship of God is not protected, God doesn't say, now wait a minute, we need to have a conference, we need to renegotiate our contract because I'm not comfortable with what you're doing and I want your input in terms of how you feel about how things are going and then maybe we can come to an agreement between a creator and creature. That's not how God approaches things. When His worship is forfeited, God simply visits. God visits on people whatever he visits on them, which we'll look at next. But we, we want to first see here that God is a sovereign God. God doesn't engage in plea bargains with those who offend his commandments. God simply visits. That means he brings something on people. It's a, it's a picture of the God who rules. He has established his law, and when his law is broken, he simply responds with justice. He has set out his law and he reacts based on the obedience or disobedience of his people. And we have to be careful when we talk about God that way because God doesn't really, he's not forced to react to anything that we do. But, but in terms of understanding how it works, that, that's how we describe it. We describe it with, with human terms. So uh, God doesn't need any referral of approval or disapproval from his people. God doesn't need anyone to prompt him or to prick him in order to visit anything on anyone. He has given his law to his people, and because he's sovereign when they, when they transgress his commandments, he, like a king, like a sovereign, acts. And he doesn't need the approval of man to do so. And that's the first reason for keeping this commandment. The first reason is that God cares about His worship just in who He is. He is a jealous God. And and therefore, He is protective of the honor of His commandment. He is a sovereign God. He is uh, independently administrating, according to His good pleasure, the things that have to do with His worship. And, And so we see God in terms of Uh, giving us reason for obedience to the second commandment, he grounds it, first of all, just simply in who he is. But there's a second reason to this commandment that's also given in uh, these verses that we're considering today. The second reason is found in his warning to the disobedient. So when man worshiped God in his own way, it is met with wrath. We see that in the second half of verse 5 when When God is not worshipped according to his own ways, it says that God visits the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate him. So in his sovereignty, in his jealousy, God will visit the iniquity of those who break the second commandment on their children. So visiting the iniquity of God is another way of saying God brings his judgments and afflicts those who transgress against His commandments. He he brings His judgments on those who forsake right worship. And it says in our text that the severity of this judgment is felt generationally. It says that the judgment is felt to the third and fourth generation of those who practice false worship. That means the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren are affected with whatever God is visiting on them in terms of punishment. Now we have to understand that and we have to understand it biblically because in other places God clearly lays out that the son is not punished for the sin of his father. So you can turn uh, to Ezekiel uh, chapter 18 and verse 20 really starting in verse 18 uh, through 20 where God is describing uh, the way in which he deals with sin among mankind. And he says very clearly in verse 20 that the soul whose sins shall die, the son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer 
for the iniquity of the Son. So the Bible in two different places seems to be at odds with each other, but if you look carefully at the context, you can see that that is not the case at all. And so let's understand Ezekiel first so that we can see clearly what is being said in the second commandment. If you look at Ezekiel 18, you see in verses 18 and 19 that the prophet is actually making a different kind of distinction. In verses 18 and 19, he's dealing with a contrast between a disobedient father and a faithful son. So the the father, he describes as one who practiced extortion, who robbed his brother, who did what was not good. But the son, in verse 19, is described as being just and right and one who observes God's statutes. And what the prophet is saying is, in that case... God will not condemn the son who is following the Lord for the sins of the fathers who has, father who has turned away from the Lord. But when you look at the second commandment, no such distinction is being made. When, it, when you see in the second commandment the qualification for this generational judgment that God visits on the breakers of the second commandment, he is visiting on it on the... the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. So so he's dealing with the entirety of that family which has turned its back on the Lord. The second commandment is not only dealing with generational judgment, but it's also dealing with generational sin. It is the sins of those who hate the Lord for generations and generations. So when it comes to the second commandment, the father despises the Lord by worshiping him in his own way. His son takes over that habit. The grandson follows in his grandfather's footsteps, and the great-grandson does what he has known for his whole life. In a sense, it's what you see in the history of the kings of Israel. We've just worked our way through the northern kingdom. The, the very depressing theme of the northern kingdom is that he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He walked in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, generation after generation after generation of kings. 300 years almost of generational unfaithfulness, of worshiping God according to their own desires. And their iniquity had a result, the result was the visiting of God on the third and fourth generation of those who hate him, consequences for the forsaking of the second commandment. So for those who walk in rebellion against the Lord, the consequence for their iniquity will be brought to them by the Lord. He will visit it on them. That judgment of God, we should never read over that judgment of God and just shrug. We must always remember how God's judgment is described in Scripture. And in Hebrews 10, verse 31, it says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is a warning, isn't it? This wrath that will be visited on the faithless one, it's a warning. It's a a warning from God to spur His people on to obedience. What we see in the uh, the footnotes, really, of the second commandment is this reason that God gives. God gives His people a healthy dose of fear. God gives His people a healthy warning, like we would give to our children who are about to walk into the path of disobedience. Remember what I've told you. Remember what will happen if you choose to do this thing then you will face this consequence. God is giving His children a warning. Fear, warning, a right motivation at times to keep yourself from sin. That's the second reason that God gives us in the second commandment. There's a third reason that's included in this second commandment as to why we should keep it. It's found in verse 6, where there is a promise given to the obedient. So there is a warning to the disobedient, but the third reason is a promise to the obedient. The wrath of God, in a sense, is contrasted with His blessing. Now what we see immediately when we look at verse 6 is how much greater God's blessing is uh, uh, over and against His, His warning and His punishment. 
God's steadfast love is shown to thousands. His, his wrath, his punishment is visited on three and four generations of those who hate him. And that's because the heart of the Lord is generous and the heart of the Lord desires to bless his people. In Deuteronomy 5 and verse 29, right after the second reading of the law, God says, Oh, speaking of God's people, oh, that they had such a mind as this always to fear me and to keep all my commandments that it might go well with them and with their descendants forever. The God of heaven, the God who gives the commandment to worship him according to his own ways, desires to bless his people. Now, immediately, uh, for us reform types especially, uh, this kind of talk raises questions in us and causes us to be careful because we're used to hearing and we're used to affirming that man's works don't merit anything. And yet here those who love God and keep his commandments are told that they will receive the blessing of his steadfast love. It seems like there is some some correlation between what we do and, and the blessings of God. But what we have to recognize is that what God's word is talking about is not a blessing unto salvation, but a blessing that flows from our Salvation. Really, the blessings of God are salvation's fruit. They are God's gifts to His children. And that's what God is talking about here in the second commandment as well. The people of God are called to walk in the commandments that God gives. And when God blesses that obedience, it is not a reward, it is a gift that He gives to His people. You can illustrate it by thinking of interpersonal relationships as well. You can think of a man who has a, uh, a tremendous company as the employees and they punch the clock. Uh, they, they, clock. They clock in and they clock out and based on their time sheets, he pays them their wages. They, they get it in an envelope. They get it through a direct deposit. Whatever they receive from this boss, it all comes to them because of the things that they have done. It all comes to them because of their works. But... When the man presents gifts to his children, if he is a good father, if he is a loving father, it's not based on what those children have done. He simply gives them gifts because he loves them, because he wants to give them uh, things that they like, things for their good. They are expressions of his love in that sense. And, and there's no weekly report that's attached to gifts that he gives to his children. It's the distinction between things that are given out of merit and things that are given strictly out of grace, out of generosity, out of a, a kind heart or a, a loving relationship. And so it is with God's promises to the obedient. They are not payment for wages. The steadfast love of God flows out of His generous love for His people. And so you can talk about the blessings that God gives to His people, which you also see in the fifth commandment, and you can talk about those things because he blesses his people not because of their works, but through the faithful expression that he has invested in the covenant relationship with his people. So the steadfast love is, is a promise. It's, it's not a wage. It's a gift. It's not, it's not a paycheck. And so those are the, the three reasons that God gives to us in his second commandment as to why we should obey this commandment. First, because of who God is in himself. Second, because of the warning of disobedience. And third, because of the blessing of obedience. So now, as a congregation, we want to think through how we should apply the second commandment in our own setting. And the first thing that I want us to consider as a congregation when it comes to the second commandment is that we should fear the warning of God. Now, at times in the church, worship is modified. And worship is modified usually in an attempt to please. Uh, uh, to please and appease not God, but man. And that can take two different forms. The first one can be <clears throat> seen when, a, when churches uh, change their pattern of worship in order to appeal to the masses. And in those situations, you see uh, the Word of God minimized or maybe not even opened. You see little discussion of sin, 
You see an atmosphere that mimics something the world would be comfortable with. Sermons are replaced with chats and, and interviews, and, and we, we know of churches like these. And in the best case scenario, these churches begin with good intentions. Their desire is to gain an audience, to be able to attract people so that they can proclaim the gospel to these people. The problem is, of course, that if you begin with appeasing the world, you have to keep appeasing the world or they will become offended at some point. Uh, in worst case scenario, of course, the intentions are not noble at all, and so then the fear of man makes them want to not offend, and so they, they fear having the world say that they're foolish. They, they fear empty seats in the building, and so the word of God is pre pre preferred to the faithfulness of worship. That's one way uh, that uh, the warning of God would come to rest on a church. But it's also true for churches that pattern their worship in blind adherence to a tradition. So as we saw last week, the elements of worship are not negotiable. Reading, the preaching of God's Word, the prayers, the sacraments, the singing, all those things are non-negotiable, but the form of those things, the form that those elements take, that's not specifically mandated in Scripture. But if your object in worship is to be faithful to a tradition rather than to give glory to God, you have really done the same thing as the church that is seeking to appease man in a loose presentation. It, it would look, the picture of the man that you're trying to please will look different. But the end result is the same. Uh, the, the, the Christian church must protect itself on, on both sides. God is a jealous God, and He will not give His worship to another. Whether that other person is dressed in skinny jeans or in a Puritan robe, He doesn't care. But if the expression of the love of His saints is not directed towards Him, but is directed towards them, the warning of the second commandment applies. That he will visit those who forsake the worship with his condemnation, with his correction, with his judgment. God reserves his worship for himself, and we cannot replace him. So we must fear the warning of God and guard ourselves against false worship. Second thing that I would have a see as a congregation that we must rest is that we must rest in the steadfast love of God. The great promise for the Christian, the great promise for his church, is that walking in the ways of the Lord means that he gives you his steadfast love. To be in Christ will by necessity indicate that you will be attentive to His commandments. It's impossible, because if you're in Christ, His Spirit dwells in you. And so what we have to see is, to receive His steadfast love, in some sense, we've already received His steadfast love. In order to uh, be blessed with His steadfast love, His steadfast love must already be present in us through the outpouring of His Spirit in our hearts. And so that's the intent of the commandment, to show us the steadfast love of God given to God in His steadfast love. Do you desire that steadfast love? Do you desire to be bathed in the favor of your God? Well, then you must pursue worship of Him in the way that He describes. True worship, true love for Him expressed according to His commandments. And yet in sin, we so often neglect these great blessings for the minuscule, for the insignificant. Think of it in terms of a, another commandment, this, the seventh commandment, for example. A man grows bored with his wife, a wife who loves him, who cares for him faithfully, he commits adultery against this wife. He forsakes his marriage vow. He forsakes his family. All that she provides him in their home. He doesn't give it a second thought. 
He doesn't consider the impact of his actions on the relationships that he has with his children. He doesn't consider how it affects his reputation in the community. All he wants is to satisfy his craving for something new. And you read and you hear about these stories and oftentimes you hear about it with heartbreak that, accom- that accompanies it shortly thereafter. A couple of months later, he, he falls ill with a disease. He has a stroke. He has something that requires permanent care. And the new flame leaves him. The wife would have served him, but the new flame leaves him. Well, that's the same thing in terms of the second commandment. Do not trade in the steadfast love of God for something that seems neat in the moment. This is what I mean. You trade in the steadfast love of Almighty God by saying, I think it would be neat to worship God in this way. You're trading in the steadfast love of God for a temporary fleeting feeling. You will not be satisfied for long with something that is neat in worship. And you're tossing an eternal treasure aside for that temporary feeling. Christian, if you have tasted the steadfast love of God, if if you have experienced its presence in your life, if you have seen God's patience and His love and His kindness to you and for you, how can you ever replace it with something that will last a month or even a year. 2 Timothy 2, verse 13, gives us great hope as we consider our own weakness in this regard. We don't remember God's steadfast love as we should. We don't receive God's steadfast love as we should. We are quick to be uh, like the prodigal. We are quick to be like the unfaithful wife of the prophet Hosea. But God in His Word gives us us comfort in places like 2 Timothy 2, verse 13. If we are faithless, He remains faithful. If you are in Christ, you have the promise of God's steadfast love. A promise that you will be blessed with in greater measure through your worship of Him according to His Word. So the second commandment is setting before us a right way to worship the Lord. And the Christian... Is not given the option of following it. The Christian is required to follow it. But more than just a cold commandment that God gives, He explains to us the reasons why. First, God Himself, in His righteous jealousy and sovereignty, desires His worship to be done according to His word by His people. Second of all, there's the warning of God as to the severity of, of God's displeasure over sin. And in the third place, we see the promised blessing of God in true worship through His steadfast love. You see, the way God is worshipped, the way man responds to who God is, shapes man's relationship with this God, whether for good or for ill. So people of God worship the Lord according to His ways that you might love Him as you should. It is not a suggestion from God's Word. He has commanded you to do so. Let's pray together. 